Jean-Pierre had surrendered to his wife's mother. Madame Levey was a woman of business, known and respected within a radius of at least 15 miles. Thick set and stout, she was seen about the country, on foot or in an acquaintance's cart, perpetually moving, in spite of her 58 years, in steady pursuit of business. She had houses in all the hamlets. She worked quarries of granite. She freighted coasters with stone, even traded with the Channel Islands. She was broad-cheeked, wide-eyed, persuasive in speech, carrying her point with the placid and invincible obstinacy of an old woman who knows her own mind. She very seldom slept for two nights together in the same house, and the wayside inns were the best places to inquire in as to her whereabouts. She had either passed, or was expected to pass there at six, or somebody, coming in, had seen her in the morning, or expected to meet her that evening. After the inns that command the roads, the churches were the buildings she frequented most. Men of liberal opinions would induce small children to run into sacred edifices to see whether Madame Levey was there, and to tell her that so-and-so was in the road waiting to speak to her about potatoes or flour or stones or houses, and she would curtail her devotions come out blinking and crossing herself into the sunshine, ready to discuss business matters in a calm, sensible way across a table in the kitchen of the inn opposite. Laterly, she had stayed for a few days several times with her son-in-law, arguing against sorrow and misfortune with composed face and gentle tones. Jean-Pierre felt the convictions imbibed in the regiment torn out of his breast, not by arguments, but by facts. Striding over his fields, he thought it over. There were three of them, three, all alike. Why? Such things did not happen to everybody, to nobody he ever heard of. One might pass but three, all three, forever useless, to be fed while he lived, and what would become of the land when he died? This must be seen to. He would sacrifice his convictions. One day he told his wife, See what your God will do for us. Pay for some masses. Susan embraced her man. He stood unbending then turned on his heels and went out. But afterwards, when a black soutane darkened his doorway, he did not object, even offered some cider himself to the priest. He listened to the talk meekly, went to mass between the two women, accomplished what the priest called his religious duties at Easter. That morning, he felt like a man who had sold his soul. In the afternoon, he fought ferociously with an old friend and neighbor who had remarked that the priests had the best of it and were now going to eat the priest-eater. He came home disheveled and bleeding and happening to catch sight of his children. They were kept generally out of the way, cursed and swore incoherently, banging the table. Susan wept. Madame Leveille sat serenely unmoved. She assured her daughter that it will pass, and taking up her thick umbrella, departed in haste to see after a schooner she was going to load with granite from her quarry. A year or so afterwards, the girl was born. A girl. Jean-Pierre heard of it in the fields, and was so upset by the news that he sat down on the boundary wall and remained there till the evening, instead of going home 
as he was urged to do, a girl. He felt half cheated. However, when he got home, he was partly reconciled to his fate. One could marry her to a good fellow, not to a good-for-nothing, but to a fellow with some understanding and a good pair of arms. Besides, the next may be a boy, he thought. Of course, they would be all right. His new credulity knew of no doubt. The old luck was broken. He spoke cheerily to his wife. She was also hopeful. Three priests came to that christening, and Madame Leveille was godmother. The child turned out an idiot, too. Then on market days, Jean-Pierre was seen bargaining bitterly, quarrelsome and greedy, then getting drunk with taciturn earnestness, then driving home in the dusk at a rate fit for a wedding but with a face gloomy enough for a funeral. Sometimes he would insist on his wife coming with him, and they would drive in the early morning, shaking side by side on the narrow seat above the helpless pig that, with tied legs, grunted a melancholy sigh at every rut. The morning drives were silent, but in the evening, coming home, Jean-Pierre, tipsy, was viciously muttering, and growled at the confounded woman who could not rear children that were like anybody else's. Susan, holding on against the erratic swayings of the cart, pretended not to hear. Once, as they were driving through Plumar, some obscure and drunken impulse caused him to pull up sharply opposite the church. The moon swam amongst light white clouds. The tombstones gleamed pale under the fretted shadows of the trees in the churchyard. Even the village dogs slept. Only the nightingales, awake, spun out the thrill of their song above the silence of the graves. Jean-Pierre said thickly to his wife, What do you think is there? He pointed his whip at the tower, in which the big dial of the clock appeared high in the moonlight, like a pallid face without eyes, and getting out carefully, fell down at once by the wheel. He picked himself up and climbed, one by one, the few steps to the iron gate of the churchyard. He put his face to the bars and called out indistinctly, Hey there, come out. Jean, return, return, entreated his wife in low tones. He took no notice and seemed to wait there. The song of nightingales beat on all sides against the walls of the church and flowed back between stone crosses and flat gray slabs engraved with words of hope and sorrow. Hey, come out, shouted Jean-Pierre loudly. The nightingales ceased to sing. Nobody, went on Jean-Pierre, nobody there. A swindle of the crows, that's what this is. Nobody anywhere. I despise it all. Alas, hoop. He shook the gate with all his strength, and the iron bars rattled with a frightful clanging like a chain dragged over stone steps. A dog nearby barked hurriedly. Jean-Pierre staggered back, and after three successive dashes got into his cart. Susan sat very quiet and still. He said to her with drunken severity, See, nobody. I have been made a fool. Somebody will pay for it. The next one I see near the house I will lay my whip on. On the black spine I will. I don't want him in there. He only helps the carrion crows to rob poor folk. I am a man. We will see if I can't have children like anybody else. Now you mind. They won't be all. All we see. She burst out through the fingers that hit her face. 
Don't say that, Jean. Don't say that, my man. He struck her a swinging blow on the head with the back of his hand and knocked her into the bottom of the cart where she crouched, thrown about lamentably by every jolt. He drove furiously, standing up, brandishing his whip, shaking the reins over the gray horse that galloped ponderously, making the heavy harness leap upon his broad quarters. The country rang clamorous in the night with the irritated barking of farm dogs that followed the rattle of wheels all along the road. A couple of belated wayfarers had only just time to step into the ditch. At his own gate he caught the post and was shot out of the cart head first. The horse went on slowly to the door. At Susan's piercing cries, the farm hands rushed out. She thought him dead, but he was only sleeping where he fell, and cursed his men, who hastened to him, for disturbing his slumbers. Autumn came. The clouded sky descended low upon the black contours of the hills and the dead leaves danced in spiral whirls under naked trees till the wind, sighing profoundly, laid them to rest in the hollows of bare valleys, and from morning till night one could see all over the land black, denuded bows, the bows gnarled and twisted as if contorted with pain, swaying sadly between the wet clouds and the soaked earth. The clear and gentle streams of summer days rushed, discolored, and raging at the stones that bear the way to the sea, with the fury of madness bent upon suicide. From horizon to horizon, the great road to the sands lay between the hills in a dull glitter of empty curves, resembling an unnavigable river of mud. Jean-Pierre went from field to field, moving blurred and tall in the drizzle or striding on the crests of rises, lonely and high upon the gray curtain of drifting clouds, as if he had been pacing along the very edge of the universe. He looked at the black earth, at the earth mute and promising, at the mysterious earth doing its work of life in death-like stillness under the veiled sorrow of the sky. And it seemed to him that to a man who's worse than childless, there was no promise in the fertility of fields that from him the earth escaped, defied him, frowned at him like the clouds, somber and hurried above his head. Having to face alone his own fields, he felt the inferiority of man who passes away before the clod that remains. Must he give up the hope of having by his side a son who would look at the turned up sods with a master's eye, a man that would think as he thought, that would feel as he felt, a man who would be part of himself and yet remain to trample masterfully on that earth when he was gone. He thought of some distant relations and felt savage enough to curse them aloud. They, never, he turned homewards, going straight at the roof of his dwelling, visible between the enlaced skeletons of trees. As he swung his legs over the stile, a cawing flock of birds settled slowly on the field, dropped down behind his back, noiseless and fluttering, like flakes of soot. That day, Madame Levey had gone early in the afternoon to the house she had near Curvagnon. She had to pay some of the men who worked in her granite quarry there, 
and she went in good time because her little house contained a shop where the workmen could spend their wages without the trouble of going to town. The house stood alone amongst rocks. A lane of mud and stones ended at the door. The sea winds coming ashore on Stonecutter's Point, fresh from the fierce turmoil of the waves, howled violently at the unmoved heaps of black boulders holding up steadily short-armed high crosses against the tremendous rush of the invisible. In the sweep of gales the sheltered dwelling stood in a calm resonant and disquieting like the calm in the center of a hurricane. On stormy nights when the tide was out the bay of Fugiri, fifty feet below the house, resembled an immense black pit from which ascended mutterings and sighs, as if the sands down there had been alive and complaining. At high tide the returning water assaulted the ledges of rock in short rushes, ending in bursts of livid light and columns of spray that flew inland, stinging to death the grass of pastures. The darkness came from the hills, flowed over the coast, put out the red fires of sunset, and went on to seaward, pursuing the retiring tide. The wind dropped with the sun, leaving a maddened sea and a devastated sky. The heavens above the house seemed to be draped in black rags, held up here and there by pins of fire. Madame Lavalier, for this evening, the servant of her own workmen, tried to induce them to depart. An old woman like me ought to be in bed at this late hour, she good-humoredly repeated. The quarrymen drank, asked for more, they shouted over the tables as if they had been talking across a field. At one end, four of them played cards, banging the wood with their hard knuckles and swearing at every lead. One sat with a lost gaze, humming a bar of some song, which he repeated endlessly. Two others in a corner were quarreling confidentially and fiercely over some woman, looking close into one another's eyes as if they had wanted to tear them out, but speaking in whispers that promised violence and murder discreetly, in a venomous sibilation of subdued words. The atmosphere in there was thick enough to slice with a knife. Three candles burning about the long room glowed red and dull, like sparks expiring in ashes. Madame Lavalier expiring in ashes. The slight click of the iron latch was at that late hour as unexpected and startling as a thunderclap. Madame Lavalier put down a bottle she held above a liquor glass. The players turned their heads. The whispered quarrel ceased. Only the singer, after darting a glance at the door, went on humming with a stolid face. Susan appeared in the doorway, stepped in, flung the door to, and put her back against it, saying half aloud, Mother. Madame Laveille, taking up the bottle again, said calmly, Here you are, my girl. What a state you are in. The neck of the bottle rang on the rim of the glass, for the old woman was startled, and the idea that the farm had caught fire had entered her head. She could think of no other cause for her daughter's appearance. Susan, soaked and muddy, stared 
the whole length of the room towards the men at the far end. Her mother asked, What has happened? God, guard us from misfortune. Susan moved her lips. No sound came. Madame Lavelier stepped up to her daughter, took her by the arm, looked into her face. In God's name, she said shakily, what's the matter? You have been rolling in mud? Why did you come? Where is Jean? The men had all got up and approached slowly, staring with dull surprise. Madame Lavalle jerked her daughter away from the door, swung her round upon a seat close to the wall. Then she turned fiercely to the men. Enough of this. Out you go. You others, I close. One of them observed, looking down at Susan, collapsed on the seat. She is, one may say, half dead. Madame Lavalle flung the door open. Get out. March, she cried, shaking nervously. They dropped out into the night, laughing stupidly. Outside, the two Lotharios broke out into loud shouts. The others tried to soothe them, all talking at once. The noise went away, up the lane, with the men who staggered together in a tight knot, remonstrating with one another foolishly. Speak, Susan, what is it? Speak, entreated Madame Lavalle, as soon as the door was shut. Susan pronounced some incomprehensible words, glaring at the table. The old woman clapped her hands above her head, let them drop, and stood, looking at her daughter with disconsolate eyes. Her husband had been deranged in his head for a few years before he died, and now she began to suspect her daughter was going mad. She asked, Does Jean know where you are? Where is Jean? 